Do you have any advice for younger writers? Yep. Um, who's the younger writer in this crowd, though? <laughs> you too. <laughs> um, I mean, read a lot and read voraciously and just read everything. You know, don't, when you're starting out, don't limit yourself to a genre or anything like that. I mean, real, read the backs of cereal boxes. You will learn even from that. Um, um, write a lot. I mean, there is no shortcut to becoming a good writer other than practice, practice, practice. Um, you know, if you can, I mean, most of us have to have day jobs after nine books, a new baby coming out in September. But even after 10 books, you know, I still have a day job. I teach at Case. Um, if you can find a day job that supports your habit of writing, that's a good thing. You know, um, uh, look for a profession where you would be writing. It might be different, you know, it could be in advertising, it could be PR, but just immerse yourself in the world of language and books. Um, okay, so going off of that, what are some of your personal favorite books and favorite authors? Um, I love Toni Morrison and I love Virginia Woolf. Um, those are probably two of my all-time, like I can go back and just pick up any Virginia Woolf or any Toni Morrison book. Um, you know, I've always felt like I um, owe a lifelong debt to uh, the Indian writer Salman Rushdie. Um, when I think it was about 10 days before I came to this country at the age of 21, my best friend in India put a copy of a book in my hands and said, read this. And she actually said, read it on the plane. But, you know, I picked it up that same evening. It was a book called Midnight's Children, which my good fortune that it just happened to be a masterpiece and probably one of the great works of the 20th century by Rushdie. Um, and that book changed my life. Um, you know, um, believe it or not, I had never read a novel up to that point by an Indian author. You know, I, in school, we mostly read British writers. And um, in my personal write, life, I mostly read American writers. You know, I read the same authors that most of you grew up reading. Um, and so I always felt like, I knew more about you know, Steinbeck's America and his California and the streets of California, whatever city he was writing about, um, than I did about, I had never seen the city of my birth reflected in the pages of a book. I had never read a book with Indian names in them. you know, And so Midnight's Children was a revelation. I was like, you can do this? Like you can tell? like. It, it, just, it just blew my mind. And it's not like I read that book and I thought, oh my god, I want to be an author. Far from it. Uh, because that book just set the bar so high that it, it's just impossible you know, to repeat that, that level of writing. Um, but so I have a sent he's my sentimental favorite writer also. But there's just so many contemporary writers right now that I adore. I heard you all had Hillary Jordan here a few years ago. Uh, Hillary's a friend, and I love Mudbound. I think that's a really good book, too. So, What have been some challenges for you while writing your books? The biggest challenge for me is time. And I think I suspect that's true for most writers, you know. Um, I don't seem, at least so far, I don't seem to have a problem with coming up with story ideas or characters or things like that. Um, but I have a day job that is increasingly more, makes more demands of my time. And um, it's getting harder, you know. Um, and, and, you know, nobody talks about this, but the physical act of writing takes a toll on the body. You know, it's still better than digging ditches. I mean, I'm not complaining about it, but it is actually a, a physical thing. You know, if, if the writing is going well and if you have time, I, I've written for seven, eight hours at a time nonstop. You know, tr 
try walking after you've yeah. sat for that long. It's hard, you know. So it's, it's just everything has to do with limitations of time and physicality, you know. But other than that, it's, it's a total joy. I mean, you will never, I have friends who are writers and we go to these, you know, book festivals and we are on panels together. And inevitably, they pull out the violin, you know. <laughs> it's so hard, you bleed on the page, you know. <laughs> Shut up, you know. <laughs> it's, it's a joy, you know. Uh, it's a joy, it's a privilege, and it's fun. I mean, I have a day job, I can pay my bills with just my day job, you know. But I can't imagine being able to make sense of the world without writing. You know, it's as simple as that. Um, so also you have uh, three children's books along with multiple fiction books. Um, what inspired you to write um, picture books for younger readers as well as fiction? Yeah, so, okay, maybe I will tell the legend story. But <laughs> So my very first picture book is called When I Carried You in My, in my Belly. And it's basically a young mother talking to her four, four-year-old daughter uh, about all the things they did when she was pregnant with her. And that's the refrain, you know, when I carried you in my belly, we, we did this, this, and this. And because of that, you are now the bravest girl in the world, the sweetest girl in the world, that kind of stuff. I wrote that, and, and you know, I didn't know that I was going to write picture books, but I was on, I was on book tour, actually, for one of my novels. And I was on a 45-minute, you know, puddle jumper flight. And it was a very, the plane was basically bobbing in the air like that. And I was scared, and I needed to distract myself. So I took one of those little uh, United Airline napkins, and I wrote the book on that. <laughs> and, and by the time we landed, I had, I had my first picture book. Wow. Um, I wrote Sugar and Milk because this was a story that I used to end every time I would do a public lecture. I very often would end by telling the story that I'm about to tell all of you. And it always got a really good response from the audience. And one day I thought, you know, this is a story. It's a story about immigration. It's a story about kindness. It's a story about generosity of spirit. Adults know these things. It's children who need to hear the, the story. And so I wrote Sugar and Milk. So basically, the legend of how my ancestors arrived in India goes like this. As I said, a small group of Persians decided they built boats, and they hopped on them, and they sailed the seas, and they arrived on the western shores of India asking to be let in, asking for refuge, basically. And the story goes that the Hindu king who met them at the shore had absolutely no desire or intention to let them in. I mean, they didn't speak the same language, you know, they looked different, I mean, why would he? So he said, sorry, we are full up. But again, there was a language barrier, so he asked one of his men to get him an empty glass and he fills the glass all the way to the top with milk and points to it as a way of saying, we are full up, right? And the leader of this small group of refugees was this pretty smart guy. So he asked one of his people to get him some sugar. And he dissolves the sugar very carefully, very gently, very slowly in this glass of milk and doesn't spill a drop. And then he points to it. And his meaning is, look, if you do let us stay, not only will we not disrupt your way of life, you know, we will merge like sugar dissolves in milk. But more than that, we will sweeten your lives with our presence, right? And the story concludes with the king just being so moved by, you know, this gesture that he welcomes them with open arms. And, you know, I'm here today probably because of something that may or may not have happened, frankly, it's a legend, <laughs> 900 years ago, you know. But I have, and this is a story that every Parsi child grows up hearing, right? 
And it's, it's a beautiful story because not only is it a story about, um, you know, kindness and hospitality and generosity and those things, it's also a story about the imagination, right? It's a story about wit. It's a story about a mind at work. And, and that mind finds a partner in, in the mind of the Hindu king. So for all those reasons, I have always connected that story with literature, you know, and its ability to bring people together.